Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hi, everybody. I'd like to introduce Sarah Lipton, director of the Montpelier Senior Activity Center here in Montpelier. And um, we're glad to have you, Sarah. What's, uh, how are you today? <laughs> well, thanks so much for having me, Linda. I'm really happy to be with you. I'm good. I'm just very much uh, running around like a chicken right now. <laughs> yeah. And I know you're understaffed, so that doesn't help either. I'm yeah. Sure. Well, that's why, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Are you from Vermont? And how did you end up at the Senior Center? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, I am not from Vermont originally. I actually grew up in Maine. Uh, but I've been here in Vermont for about 12 years, I think it is now. I lose track of time a little bit. Um, I have many different stripes and hats. Um, I uh, came out as a queer person in the 90s, which was a terrible thing to do. <laughs> Um, and then um, traveled the world for a little while and went to Naropa University, which is a Buddhist university. Spent about 20 years um, pursuing the Shambhala Buddhist path and teaching leaders all over the world how to really show up and be who you are and connect to your vision so that you can actually land it and move forward. I had a business called The Presence Point, which I was doing that work through. I launched a nonprofit called Genuine. Um, and actually created a podcast, which is out there. You can listen to it anywhere. It's Genuine, the podcast, um, Genuine comma, the podcast, but it's out there, um, which I co-hosted with a, a dear friend of mine. And we interviewed people all over the world um, and some famous people too, which was fun, really about what sparks and inspires them. And I have two small girls and um, seven and five, and during the pandemic had to stay home with them. And so my businesses kind of went, hmm nothing um and yeah. I had to then figure out what to do and wound up coming back to work but not the way I imagined um I wound up actually running the feast program here at the senior center and I fell in love with it and then when the former director decided she needed to move on I thought well I have all this leadership background training other people. I could probably just step in and do this. And so I've been doing that for the last year. I've been the director and I love it. It's total chaos when I have not enough staff, but um, which has kind of been all year, but, <laughs> um, but I get to bring all of my creative energies into this place and connect across the whole community. I just had an hour long meeting with someone from Kellogg Covered Library about all the things that we're gonna do together. And, I've loved connecting with you, Linda, and the Rainbow Umbrella Group because I'm so excited we're going to be able to offer more LGBTQ programming with our poetry readings and, you know, some maybe open mic and comedy nights and things like that, which is going to be really fun. And I think it's just really important to be able to create a space here that's inclusive and welcoming to any older adult that wants to come in. And older adult is a very wide definition. You know, our membership is 50 and up. And we offer a wide array of things. And I'm really excited to let people know that we're here and we're open and we're doing stuff. We're about to launch 40 classes this fall. I know I was gonna ask you about that, but we'll get to that, like how many classes and, and all, but has it been hard to get back into swing after the pandemic? I mean, yes, that kind of very just shut so. everything down for two years, so. Very hard. Um, I think the hardest thing, the biggest impact I would say is that we had to stop doing our congregate meals, which were where many people, up to 100 people on Tuesdays and Fridays would come in and eat together. And not being able to do that because of the pandemic and not being safe for people to be unmasked in the same space and all of that, I think has been the hardest thing for many of our older older, older adult members. Um, I know that they miss it. Um, they're telling me a lot right now about that. And I'm listening and I'm trying to figure out how we can open fully back in a safe way. And I don't really have the answer yet, but, but I'm working on it. Um, and I think one of the things that's really, really been key for me and my role and my time this past year 
is listening, is meeting the diverse array of members that we have and as much as I can, or as much as people are willing to come out and meet me <laughs> um, to find out what people want. You know, I, I can create for creating sake or I can create what you actually want. Um, this Senior Activity Center is a place for you to create I what know. you want. And you must, it must have to be, you know, like, especially for older, older adults, you know, the idea of COVID is a very uh, dangerous thing. And so you have to try to juggle all that, you know, the needs of the community and how to do that in a way that's going to benefit everybody is, is it's a, hard is because I think place to be. It's very difficult. And I think, you know, as we all saw, one of the most harmful aspects besides the actual medical aspects of COVID was the isolation, you know, was the lack of social engagement. And, and that is one of the hardest things to recreate while we do still have to wear masks and we do have to still be aware of, of you know, COVID is totally still out there. I mean, I know three people right now that are out with COVID. You know, know. it's not, not here, it's still here. And we're open and trying to figure it out. And so I think, you know, as with most things in life, one of the hardest things is patience, <laughs> you know, yeah. just trying to figure it out. I mean, we've, we've been working really hard to create a really robust environment of activity to create that sense of thriving for our, our aging and older adults. And, and yet it's still hard to get people to come engage with things if you don't feel safe. And that's just a, that's a puzzle. So are you still going to continue doing both, like maybe some activities in person that people can come to and then yes. do things as well? Absolutely. You don't feel comfortable. Good. Absolutely. So we had to shift away from our congregate meals. We shifted over to the curbside meals so folks can come and pick up a meal on Tuesdays and Fridays at the curb. You're welcome to bring your meal inside and eat together. We are going to try to figure out the congregate meals again. And then in terms of our activities, we still have a lot of drop-in groups where folks can come and play Scrabble or I was going to say Parcheesi. I don't think that's one of them. I think it's bridge. Scrabble or Bridge. I know people yep. play Bridge. Yeah. Yep. Um, we've got a number of other games. And then um, I guess I want to play Parcheesi. Mahjong. <laughs> yeah, Mahjong. Thank you. And then we have some musical groups that play together and um, our walks with Joan on Monday mornings. And we, of course, have the Trash Tramps group as a walk-in um, drop-in group. And then we are gonna be having quite a number of new classes coming in this fall. We've got an English country dance class that's gonna be starting up. We have um, a couple of really interesting brain classes, a, a class on neurodiversity in the aging brain that'll be in person here. Another class um, about games, actually about how games and puzzles work with the aging brain and how you can kind of enjoy sort of massaging your brain <laughs> through playing games basically and then and we've got, got the trash tramps yeah we've got the trash tramps we've got a feels like a thousand different yoga classes mostly those are still all online but we do have some hybrid classes we have a space upstairs that is our hybrid room so we have classes where the instructor and a few participants can be together in the room and on the screen the rest of the participants are there so we do have a hybrid setup and I'm investigating being able to create a second hybrid space. So out of the 40 plus classes we have this fall, I think about 16 are gonna be in person. That's nice. Yeah. I, I know from people I've talked to and myself who said it's been very difficult um, and people are very anxious to get back, even yeah. though we have to navigate how to do that. But I think, especially for seniors and people who are, you know, living in the country, this might have been one of the only ways they had to connect with other people. So right. it's really right. important to get back to that. Um, Absolutely. So uh, you have yoga and then you have, and then we're going to have an LGBTQ poetry reading in October. Yep. And um, so it sounds like you're really getting back to. Oh, in the farm stand. Oh, the farm stand. Yeah. Yes. We have our farm stand. So Back in May, the Parks Department, in, co in coordination with us, decided to create a farm stand right out front of our building here every Wednesday from one to three, selling for a dollar a piece, the beautiful fresh produce that's coming from the Feast Farm, which the Parks Department runs to grow food for our own Feast Senior Meals program. 
there's a surplus of food. And so we're able to sell very low cost to folks. Um, and we have, because we received an, a grant, really nice grant from AARP for this kind of community placemaking activity, we've been creating events at the farm stand as well. So we have an incredible array of different things happening every Wednesday from, you know, yesterday we had the community jam that was performing and a presentation by Everybody Wins, which is a really cool organization that matches older adults with kids for a reading program. Um, we've and had the music some... at the farm stand was great yesterday. Yeah, you probably could hear it upstairs. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have two musicians, two different music musical groups coming next week. So good. <laughs> <to> enjoy again. <laughs> and and, and had... then you have the, the event in the park in the back, right? Like, is that? Yes. So then there's the Berry Street potluck. So yeah. we've been working with the Capital Area Neighborhoods and the Center for Arts and Learning right next door. The three of us have been collaborating. We have a meeting tonight to plan the next event in, I guess that will be in September. Um, and looking at what all we can do to bring more vibrancy and engagement just here on Berry Street, you know, amongst our neighbors. We've already seen, just we've had two events and we've already seen how much life there is here. You know, Berry Street is a very dense neighborhood and sometimes it feels a little hard to kind of break into the community here because it's so dense. And so we're just trying to create some con like continuous events to bring people out and to connect. And we've been having these potlucks with really interesting, engaging activities at them. I think there was a speed networking event last time and there's some other fun things that we're planning. And maybe, maybe next year we'll do a festival. It's kind of our, yeah. our dream. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you were part of the Pride Festival. Yes. And went here with art and different organizations. Yeah. That was really good. And you put a flag up. Yes. I myself climbed out the window on that Pride flag. <laughs> I had to get city council approval and I got it. <laughs> good. Good. And I didn't so, know. <laughs> yeah. And it's really important, especially in the winter here, to have places that people can go and gather and and hang out and and do all those activities and you've been great really uh i've noticed a huge change um i've noticed that there's much more going on much more interaction uh with people um and and really you know making everybody feel really really welcome and i i think that is an amazing uh quality that you have and i really appreciate it it's um it's really nice to have someone that's really involved and really, really wants to do things for the community. We, so we I, I flag too, by the way. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, and the queer community really appreciates you. Yay. And um, we'll see you soon, I'm sure. And uh, is there anything else you would like to tell people before we sign off? I think just to let you know really that the door's open. You don't have to be over 50 to come in here. We've got lots going on. You know, our classes are open. Basically, most of them are open. You could be a teenager and come take a class here. Our classes are super affordable. We have an incredible amount of amazing instructors and whether it's an online class or an in-person class, you're going to make community connection here. And I think that that's there's a vibrancy to that that I think is so important in our community, especially as we're coming out of this pandemic era. And so I just really want to encourage folks to just come by, check us out. We've got so much going on and we're really, we're here for you. And when are dues due? When do people oh, sign up? It's only once a year. July, I think, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's July. Yeah. And it's only $25 to be a member. So, you know, not well, a big deal. Get membership in though, because, you know, it really helps to... Yeah to keep yeah. the programs going and yeah. uh, pay people and do all the other stuff that the center right. wants to do, so. We have a monthly newsletter. You can sign up to receive that. We have our weekly e-letters, get on our email list. We're on social media. If you wanna find us, we're there on Instagram and Facebook. And so yeah. if people wanna reach you and I'll put this on, make sure that it's on the line, but um, I could put up the telephone number, but do you have a, a Facebook or web page? Email. Oh yeah, we have our website, which is um, it's montpelier-vt.org. It's like a it's, the, it's the Montpelier City website, montpelier-vt.org, and then uh, I think it's like backslash Montpelier okay. City Activity Center or something like that. 
and that's your web page and will that list also like what classes and oh, yeah. what's going on there okay good so we'll make sure we put that up on the screen okay great thank, thank you. you sarah so much thank you linda my best to you coming in. in yeah <laughs> take care <laughs> so several years ago first by executive action and then by legislative action we created an Office of Racial Equity. And we hire, or Vermont hired, a single individual to carry on a momentous task. Well, since that time, Vermont has seemed to wake up to the fact that maybe that person could use some help. So, there has been an effort to expand and to clarify the expectations of the Office of Racial Equity. And joining me today is one of those people who have been brought in to carry on this work. Please welcome Jay Green to All Things LGBTQ. Hello. Welcome. Thank you and, for having me. And, and we are so glad that you were able to fit us into your schedule. And I don't need to ask you about your pronouns because I see they are prominently displayed. Yes, indeed. I, I went on Etsy and got a custom made pronoun necklace that is very large so that it's readable from far away. <laughs> very good. I try. So, oh. so why don't we start with a little bit about you? What is it? that brought you to Vermont? Yeah, um, I grew up in Rochester, New York and um, moved around the country and eventually ended up at UC Berkeley in California doing my Master of Public Health degree. And uh, when I started at UC Berkeley, my family moved, my parents relocated from where they were in Minneapolis to, um, to Lebanon, New Hampshire. And um, my dad was working at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center in the uh, in an administrative capacity. And I, uh, my mom was unfortunately uh, diagnosed with a recurrence of her breast cancer that had um, first uh, first occurred back in like 2002 or something. So it was um, sort of. Uh, unexpected to say the least to have it come back like a decade later a decade and a half later and um as her uh you know time on this earth was sort of dwindling um i realized that it was really important for me to move back to the east coast and be be with her uh for as, as much as i could and i was fortunate to um do uh, a summer internship in the uh, summer of 2016 with the new hampshire bureau of infectious disease control and then I relocated to the Upper Valley permanently in spring of 2017 and was able to stay with my mom and um, spend time with her until she passed away in January of 2018. So I was um, uh, living with my folks uh, up until January of 2018 when I relocated to Red River Junction and got my own place to live. And um, I feel very fortunate that I landed in a really, uh, a really great spot for me. Um, I transferred from the University of California Berkeley Public School of Public Health to the University of Vermont's um, distance learning program, which would turn out to be fortuitous. And, you know, in a couple of years, uh, it was great to be in a distance learning program ahead of 2020. And um, yeah, so, so things sort of all worked out in a really uh, positive way for me when I, when I relocated from California to Vermont. And um, it was obviously, you know, uh, difficult with my mom's passing, but um, I think about her a lot in my job. And I, I think about, you know, am I, am I making my mom proud with my, with my life choices quite a bit? And I think, I, I think it's safe to say that she would be proud of me for, for doing what I'm doing with the Office of Racial Equity. She was very strong. I mean, she brought me and my younger sibling to um, anti-Iraq and Afghanistan war protests when we were like five or six years old to, to start building up a conscientious objector file for us <laughs> so we wouldn't get drafted. So, um, 
yeah, it was, you know, she was, she was a really strong believer in, in the values of uh, social equity and, um, and uh, pacifism and um, yeah. So that's, that's the very long answer to how did I get to Vermont <laughs> is a combination of family circumstances and, um, and just, I don't know, sort of luck, I guess. So how did you happen to stumble across the position at the Office of Racial Equity? And what about the position was attractive to you? And I think you've alluded to some of the, the underlying family beliefs that might have played a little role. Definitely, yeah. Um, so I, I graduated from the um, University of Vermont Master of Public Health program in um, October of 2021. Um, and I spent a few months looking for work, um, applied to lots of different positions. And uh, one day I was on the um, Vermont.gov, you know, careers website. And uh, I noticed that this position had popped up with the um, Office of Racial Equity. And I was like, hmm, Office of Racial Equity. I've never heard of, I've never heard of the Vermont Office of Racial Equity before. This is interesting. So I looked through it and um, it seemed like a really great match between my interests and skill sets and what they were looking for in, in a policy and research analyst. Um, as I kind of did my master of public health training um, and education, it, it seemed to me more and more, the more and more I learned about the conditions that create disparities in health, the more and more it felt like, what are we doing if we're not attacking those problems at the root. And a lot of the times the root cause is systemic racism or um, laws or policies and procedures that have been put in place at the government level that actually keep systemic racism in play. So it made sense to me to, to transition from uh, public health focus to a broader, more systemic, like government-wide focus. And that's what's really cool about the Office of Racial Equity is that we're able to interface with um, every branch of state government. And um, that's all within the purview of the Office of Racial Equity. So that's very cool. And I get to use fancy words like purview in my job, which is fun. Um, <laughs> so, so let's talk a little bit about what is unique and distinct about the Office of Racial Equity and then how the mission or the work of racial equity extends out and involves you with the work of other state agencies, commissions, departments, because as, as people have heard me carry on ad nauseum, I get concerned at times that we create silos, a sort of separate but equal, and we don't allow the, the true intersectionality of our issues to really manifest. Absolutely, yeah. And um, I love that you brought up intersectionality because that was uh, certainly um, something that brought me to the Office of Racial Equity was um, sort of understanding myself as a transgender person and starting to lose my cisgender privilege when I started transitioning in 2019 made me extremely aware of the, the impacts that these kind of um, instances of discrimination or harassment have on people because I was like pretty happily, you know, sailing my way through the world as a white woman for 27 years, you know, and that was like fine. And I just didn't have to think about how my whiteness or cisgender status um, really offered me any kind of privilege because that's the thing about privilege is that it's really invisible. You don't see what you're, what you're just getting as the default. Um, so once I started transitioning and getting misgendered and experiencing, you know, job related harassment because I was using they, them pronouns, um, it was like, okay, this is, this is how it feels to experience discrimination. And this is like, this is a, a deep, uh, unsettling problem. And I'm white. I don't have to deal with racial microaggressions. I don't have to deal with, um, you know, um, any comments related to my, my language, you know, because English is my first language. Um, so 
this, it was a really important um, motivating factor for me for joining the Office of Racial Equity was like this, where I can, I can turn off my racial equity work as soon as I turn off my work laptop. You know, I don't have to walk out and live my life in, in public as a person of color and experience those uh, racially motivated instances of discrimination. So if I can contribute my energy towards the work of racial equity, that's a positive thing for, for the world. Um, so I, I, I feel like I'm still answering your previous question a little bit, but I wanted to, to put that out there because I think it's a really, um, it's a really uh, important message. Um, so, um, and also it's why I'm on all things LGBTQ because <laughs> I wouldn't be here if I wasn't somewhere in that alphabet soup. Um, so I, I, I'd say I represent mostly the T in LGBTQ plus. And uh, um, so to, to speak a little bit more about the Office of Racial Equity, um, the Office of Racial Equity was just my supervisor, uh, executive director of, of Racial Equity, Susanna Davis, for about two and a half years. And then uh, the, the second report of the Racial Equity Task Force made a request to the legislature that they add more staff positions and more funding for the office. Um, so I was hired in February of 2022, and uh, my coworker, Shalini Surya Naraina, was hired uh, just a month before me. Uh, at the end of January 2022. And <laughs> of course, I'm getting notifications there. Um, and uh, so now we're a three person office. And um, the uh, sort of mission statement or goal of our office is to um, work towards dismantling those instances where systemic racism pops up in our state government. And um, it's, um, it's, I mean, it's, uh, it's a very big task and it is, um, it can definitely feel overwhelming at times. And um, that is, you know, just kind of, uh, it's like that saying about if you have like a really big project or something, you have to like eat the elephant one bite at a time or something. Like how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So yeah, that's that's kind of where we're at. We're, we're, we're going after the elephant of racial equity one, one bite at a time with uh, the three of us in the office. And now we've added a, uh, we have an intern with us temporarily for the summer and uh, we will soon be um, hiring for a new, office that was created within the Office of Racial Equity, which is the Division of Racial Justice Statistics that was created by uh, H546, or um, I believe that was Act 142. Don't, don't quote yes. me on that. I think it was Act 142 um, last uh, legislative session. So that's very exciting as well. Um, and I, I was going to yeah. say, to give people an idea, I mean, you're talking about taking a bite out of the elephant. And I'm not really sure that people appreciate the task that the Office of Racial Equity has been handed. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could share some of the specific projects and initiatives that you're currently working on so that people can get a sense of, and we expect for people to do this? Uh, absolutely, yeah. So, um, so I'm uh, my official title is um, racial equity policy and research analyst, and my my coworker Shalini's title is education and outreach specialist, uh, associate. Excuse me, education and outreach associate. Um, and um, so, uh, the the little uh, blurb that you can um, read on our website reads that. Um, that uh, the office works with local, state, federal, and nonprofit partners to advance equity in all areas of life in Vermont. Um, so all areas of life, what does that mean? So for example, uh, the notification that I just received on my computer was an invitation to work with the Department of Health with, uh, on a, a project called Stretch, which is organized through the CDC Foundation. And I know that um, Shalini and my uh, supervisor, uh, EDR, executive director, Susanna Davis, will be uh, working on that this afternoon uh, while I am chatting with you. Um, 
So um, I believe that they are collaborating with the Department of Health on um, trying to reform the grant making system in, in Vermont to make it a more equitable uh, funding method and more equitable funding distribution method. Um, let's see, uh, my role specifically as policy and research analyst, I do a lot with the legislature, um, giving testimony on bills, um, when the legislature is in session uh, and um, doing outreach to members of the legislature to talk through, uh, you know, what what are sort of the policies and um, where the what are the places that uh, racial inequity shows up in our legal system and in the laws and and regulations and policies of the state of Vermont and where can where can they be changed to make things more equitable. Um, Shalini has a ton of projects that she's been working on. She does all kinds of educational trainings and talks to um, different boards and commissions around the state about how to focus on equity in their work uh, and how to bring an equity lens, as we like to say, to um, all of their different projects. Um, uh, let's see, uh, we're working on a... Um, uh, language access plan for the state. We want to make sure that everyone who lives in Vermont has the ability to access the same government services and programs as someone who speaks English as their first language. And that includes people who are from other countries and may speak, you know, um, Pashto or Dari if you're from Afghanistan, or um, Kurundi or Swahili if you're from uh, Central Africa. Um, and uh, You know, that's uh, a pretty big project to say the least to uh, to figure out how do we um, how do we convince everyone in the state to get on board with this idea that um, yes, all government services should be available to everyone who lives here, which seems really simple when you say it like that, but um, that that's kind of the way that a lot of this works, where you say something like everyone in the state should have the same level of access to government services and programs. And then you get into sort of the implementation of it and it gets really complicated really fast. <laughs> from, from what you've been listing for the initiatives and projects you're working on, a lot of it would seem to rely upon getting comprehensive and accurate data collection so that you can truly, so you can give a true analysis of who is able to and who is not able to access services. Yeah. Are, are Vermont agencies, and I'm using the term agency in a broad context, meaning, meaning not just the state of Vermont governmental infrastructure, but you know the, the nonprofits and the service providing networks, are they willing to engage with you or with the Office of Racial Equity, are they providing you with data? And are we capturing what we need for data so that you can make policy recommendations? Oh, that's a, that's a very big question. Um, yes, that's I, why I yeah, asked you. Exactly, I, I'd say that, um, I'd say that it there's definitely different levels of, of ability to capture data accurately depending on who you're talking about. And it's one of the one of the topics that we're actively working towards reforming is um, making data a lot more inclusive. For example, um, the Office of Racial Equity is a participant on the Health Equity Advisory Commission, which is um, Susanna is the current chair of the Health Equity Advisory Commission, and um, I've been going to meetings since I started in this position. And one of the things that um, the Health Equity Advisory Commission is is doing is making uh, writing a report that will include recommendations towards uh, defining categories other than white and non-white for data collection around race and ethnicity in Vermont, and that's kind of where we're at with a lot of um, data collection in the state of Vermont around race and ethnicity is that people get separated into white or not white. And that 
framework is uh, super problematic because it frames things around whiteness. You're defining people as white or not white. You know, that's um, how are people of color supposed to feel represented by that data when they're not even identified past, well, you're not white. You know, that's, that's a really concerning uh, pattern in the state of Vermont that, that we're trying to advocate that, that it gets changed, that we have, um, so the, the Health Equity Advisory Commission is, is going to be making recommendations to the legislature that we set out some, uh, some better categories for people so that they can hopefully see themselves reflected in the data better. And um, then we can use that data to better understand where, where, what the situation is in Vermont for people. Um, so uh, for example, there was a really great um, paper that was recently published by some researchers from Stanford where they looked at um, uh, health disparities among um, parent pairs in California and they uh, went through and changed their birth certificate form so that you could identify yourself as the parent giving birth or the parent not giving birth instead of um, mother and father. And that left the door open for mother-mother pairs to, um, to be counted in the California birth certificate records. And what they found was that actually um, parents where the pairs, uh, parents where it was uh, parents who were identified as two mothers had worse health outcomes related to pregnancy and giving birth than um, mother-father pairs did. And they wouldn't have been able to find that um, health disparity out if they hadn't asked, you know, if they hadn't changed the birth certificate so that your child could be, you know, accurately reflect your family structure, not being cis heteronormative. Um, so, and they also now are able to measure the birth outcomes for trans men who give birth and the birth outcomes for non-binary people who are the birth giving parent. Like it was a really great paper because it really showed how a very small change to the record keeping system in California actually opened up this huge wealth of knowledge to be able to find health disparities where previously they weren't even able to measure them. Um, so it, it would be really great to see a similar process um, take place here in Vermont, but especially with health data, and I know that we've talked about this before, when it comes to electronic health records and uh, health systems, it can be very challenging to get the companies that make those software platforms to add a third option for gender, for example, besides male and female, which are words for sex and not gender, by the way. So it's, you know, it's, um, it's uh, it's a lot. It's a lot to to think about, and it's a lot to uh, it's it's a big elephant to eat. <laughs> so, in our remaining time, you know, and again, I'm going to go back to the concern that I have personally about creating silos. Mm -hmm. What is it that Vermont's LGBTQ plus two S plus communities could be doing to become more actively involved and supportive of the work of the Office of Racial Equity? Yeah, um, so I think that one of the, one of the first, one, well, I'll say this, one of the things I love about Vermont is that even though people aren't always as aware of the you know, preferred language around certain social topics, or um, maybe they hadn't heard of, you know, whatever before. I found that people are very willing to listen and very willing to learn. And I think that's awesome um, because that's really where all of this change starts from is a place of learning. And um, so I think that um, for our white LGBTQIA plus viewers, um, a really great place to start is just educating yourself on um, sort of the history of the United States and where all of these systemic racism, where, where all of this comes from, where is the origin. It's a lot of stuff that we're just not taught in our school system. Um, I recently finished reading The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. That's a fantastic book about the criminal justice system and how the war on drugs has really contributed to a lot of the racial inequities that we see today. Um, the uh, 
Office of Racial Equity has a, a reading list on our website. And we also, the uh, Vermont League of Cities and Towns recently released an equity toolkit that includes an excellent reading list with a ton of video resources and podcasts to listen to. Um, I know I personally get tired of reading sometimes and do a lot of listening to audiobooks while I'm cooking or cleaning up. So um, definitely recommend checking out the, uh, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns uh, podcast list um, to learn more. So yeah, just really think through, um, you know, doing that learning, doing that work and try and lean on other white people when you're encountering the emotional challenges that come with it. Um, because it is, I can speak from personal experience, it can be really um, horrifying and exhausting to learn about the impacts of systemic racism. And, um, you know, talk with your therapist, talk with your, your white friends, don't put that, the, the people of color in this state already know about it from personal experience, you don't need to put that on them. Um, so, you know, do, do some learning, um, talk with your white friends, talk with your therapist, talk with, with uh, you know, uh, other white people about it. Don't burden your, your friends of color with uh, your racial equity learning just yet um, because, you know, it's for a lot of white people and I include myself in this category, there's been a lot of like, oh, oh, kind of moments. And um, that, the fact that it's taken me until age 31 to have those like learning aha moments is a reflection of my white privilege. And it's fine to experience that and it's fine to feel grief and, and sadness about it, but it's not fine to put that emotional labor on your friends and, and people of color who already experience that in their personal day-to-day -day life. So, <laughs> so that's so my with, advice. <laughs> I was gonna say, so with that, I need to say thank you and it sounds like we both give our peers of privilege permission to feel uncomfortable oh, yeah. with their privilege and to be willing to challenge it. And I already am planning on inviting you back to talk about what comes out of the racial justice piece yeah. and the direction that might be moving in. So Absolutely. with that. Thank you for spending this time with us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And um, yeah, uh, thanks. You'll be, thanks so much. Yeah. <laughs> and you'll be back. I'll be back. <laughs> so. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist.